Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Categorically Romance Podcast. My name is Bree, and I am joined by author Melissa Sennett today. Welcome to the podcast, Melissa. We're so happy to have you. Thank you so much. It's so great to be here, and thank you for having me. Yes. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? This is your first time on. I'm so excited. So tell Aww. us a little bit about you. Thank you. Um, well, I'm the author of 40 plus books, mostly romances for um, Harlequin's special edition line. I grew up in New York and New Jersey, but I've lived on the coast of Maine for the past 20 years. And summertime in Maine, like right now, is so spectacular that it makes you completely forget the very snowy winters, which is why I'm still here. Yeah. What, um, what inspired the move? Like, had you visited there and just were like, let's just do this or what? Yeah, basically that. And at the time I had a two-year-old and I thought, hmm, you know, living in New York City versus living in Maine and having the woods and the ocean and the mountains as the backdrop, it just seemed like a dream come true. And also it seemed like it would feel like a writer's retreat that I would never have to go home from. And it sort of really has been like that. I love that. I love that you just were like, let's just go for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, we were chatting before we hit record. Like one of my favorite shows is The Lost Kitchen. And I just love keeping up with Aaron French and it's all up there. And I just love all the like how like the farmers and all of that, they like everybody helps each other. And yeah. Like you said, like you, you don't even, you forget all about the crazy winters. Cause like the spring and the summer just looks so beautiful. So it's like, you're all, you're in your own little fairy tale world up there. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have some get to know you questions, some icebreakers. Um, first thing that comes to mind. Um, so tell us two of your favorite things in the world. Okay. Well, um, I live in a beach town in Maine and being able to walk to the ocean and stare at the water always does wonders for me like for my mood and plotting books, daydreaming. And I particularly love the beach at low tide and like all the amazing finds like shells, periwinkles, even seaweed. And another favorite thing is my dog who's sitting right next to me. Um, he looks like a mini German shepherd and he is the best dog on earth. He does not make a peep. He is so sweet. <laughs> but I, I, you know, I do have to say those, I, I just said my two favorite things, but um, my very favorite thing in the world is really my son. Um, he's 21. He's a rising college senior and he's home for the summer. And that makes me so happy. Oh, I love that. Oh, I'm not ready. My oldest two will be ninth graders this year. And I told Aww. them, I was like, guys, it's going to be so fast. It's going to happen yeah. so fast. Were you ready? Like, did you feel like the world prepared you for your baby leaving or no? You know, not at all. And in fact, like I thought, Ooh, you know, it'll be kind of cool to have an empty nest and my schedule will be my own. And the first six months that he was gone and he was five and a half hours away, like I was teary, like a lot of the time and everything felt off kilter. Like it's just, you know, you have this huge responsibility to another person and, you know, I'm constantly thinking of a schedule and then it's all of a sudden he's not here. It was so strange. Yeah. But, you know, after about six months, I got used to it. And luckily, he's a texter and a FaceTimer. So I always felt connected. Good. Good. Um, what is your favorite color to wear? Well, when I was a New Yorker for 20 years, I lived in black. <laughs> and, you know, now that I've been a Mainer for 20 years, I'm still on the same scale. But I love like a, a silvery, shimmery gray. And I tend to wear a lot of like that kind of shades, black, white, and gray. Do you go back to New York often or, or no? You know, I, I don't go too often because, um, you know, it's a long drive or a long bus ride or, you know, train rides. But um, when I when I do go back, I I just feel, you know, I remember why I loved it so much and I do miss it, but I do like the calm and peacefulness yeah. You know, of living in a rural state. Yeah. I think what I imagine is so cool about living on that side of the country is the fact that it's not that long of a like travel commute. Like if you want to go have that city escape, you can. Oh, yeah. Versus when I think of like, oh, let's because my husband's from Brooklyn. I'm like, I would love to go. We still have never went. And I'm like, it would take <laughs> us a whole day <laughs> to drive there. <laughs> 
Yeah. And for, for me, it's really like maybe six hour drive. And, and then Boston is an hour and a half away from me. Oh, that's so that's also yeah. great. Yeah. Well, if you came with a warning label, what would it say? I just love this question. Um, I think it would say you might be transformed unrecognizably into a minor character in my next book. <laughs> okay. That writer brain is always, yeah. always going. <laughs> Tell us one of the songs on the soundtrack to your life. Um, there are so many, but my favorite song of all songs, which has been the case since like 1981 when I think it came out and I was 16 then, um, is a song called Romeo and Juliet by the band Dire Straits. And this is a band I don't even really like particularly, but that song is just the most amazing songs. It's about a broken relationship and yearning. And sometimes like if I'm writing and I'm stuck in a scene, I'll listen to that song and it just gets me moving along because it's just so emotionally honest. I just love it. Yeah. I mean, and that's, I think I'm, I'm an eighties baby, but <laughs> my mom was like such an eighties teenage girl Aww. that I grew up yeah, that like was loving that. And I think like, um, head over heels by tears for fears is like Aww, the yes. number one song. <laughs> yeah. I love it. It's just, and I, I, I teach sixth grade. So I played it one day for my kids and they're like, why are you crying? I'm like, you guys just don't get it. It's such a good song. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> I'm like this whole decade was just full of amazing music. It's true. Um, who is one of your most read authors? Well, there's so many, but um, I really love Ellen Hildebrand. Oh, and every okay. summer I look forward like to her new book, you know, like you've got Nantucket, The Beach, A Hint of Glamour. She has these intelligent, warm characters and all these emotional angles that are always so interesting. I really, really love her books. Yeah. And what's one of your favorite romance tropes to read? I love the classic marriage of convenience storyline, like when the couple has to marry for this or that reason, um, particularly when one feels forced into it to like to save the ranch or the family empire, and the other has been secretly in love mm -hmm. with their name, own, like their in name only spouse since like middle school. Like that's, yeah. that's my absolute favorite. We love hearing romance origin stories. So can you share how you became a romance reader? Well, um, way back in the, I think it was the late eighties, I happened to read my very first romance novel ever by um, the author Janet Ivanovich, who was actually writing under a pseudonym at that time for a category romance line called Second Chance at Love. And the book was titled Foul Play, and it was so funny and so charming and emotional, and I was hooked on romance from that book on. Like, I can't even remember the details of the plot, but it was like one of those classic boss secretary books. And for some reason, there was a dancing chicken. Like it was just <laughs> the funniest, warmest book. I just loved it. And that just got me into romance for all time. Well, for anyone who's new to your bibliography that's listening, I'm always hoping somebody new to somebody just so happens to listen. How would you describe the kind of books you enjoy writing? Well, I love writing about cowboys and ranchers, Western settings. Um, I love writing about single parents, particularly of babies. And I love writing about how the past affects the present and gets in the couple's way. And I just really love watching the characters go from having hearts under lock and key to falling in love almost against their will. Did you, do you feel like you grew into what you enjoy writing now or has that always been your thing? Well, because I started out writing like single gal in the city type books um, and I'm, I was always from a city environment that it never occurred to me that I might like to write books that I love to read. Like I always love reading Western romances and cowboy heroes. And when I finally wrote my first one, I was like, this is what I love to write. And I'm not even sure why exactly, but it's, it's my favorite and I've never veered from it, you know, in, you know, years now. Well, from what I could see online, your first title was C. Jane Date, and it released with Harlequin's Red Dress Ink line in 2001. So can you walk us through your journey to becoming published? Like, what did it look like for you? Well, before I was a writer, I was actually a book editor. 
And I always wanted to write, but to be honest, like I had no confidence. And uh, when I heard that Harlequin was looking for, they were going to start an imprint, um, which was then known as Chicklet, which is what um, Red Dress Inc. was, um, basically light humorous novels that focused on like all facets of a woman's life, particularly dating, career, family. I knew that if I was ever going to try to write a book, this was my time because I was single. I was in my 30s. I was dating like a fiend to find the one. And I just put my heart and soul into that book because I felt like I have nothing to lose. I'm just going to try. Here it goes. And when I got to typing the words the end on the final page of that manuscript, it will always be like one of my proudest moments that I actually did it. Like I just couldn't believe it. I have to say from the little bit of time that we've talked, you just seem to have lived like the coolest life. Oh. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I didn't realize that it, I was introduced to this, this line very recently because one of my girlfriends is obsessed. She loves like women's fiction and yeah. she, and, and, and chick lit and she, I don't even remember how she stumbled across it, but she was like, have you heard of this red dress ink? And I'm like, no. And so we have just been kind of obsessing over it. And I didn't realize like, yeah, it's, it's, very much chiclet. And I think that's so special that Harlequin did that. <laughs> I know. I love that. Yeah. It was such a great line and just so much fun. Yeah. So this is 2001. So here you are. It sounds like you really kind of did it for yourself. Um, but what did like the world of romance publishing feel like for you at that time as you were entering into it? I mean, you had done book editing, but as a writer, how did it feel? Well, you know, the tail end of 2001 was a particularly very difficult time and a painful time mm -hmm. in New York City where I lived, you know, and across the country. And CJ and Date was published two months after 9-11. And during an interview with a reporter about the book, I was asked why anyone would be drawn to reading a lighthearted, fluffy book about dating and finding yourself in such a time of national tragedy. And, you know, there was some disdain in that reporter's voice, you know, as he asked me that question. And my response was that books and movies, you know, music, art, it, it's all there to move people in some way. And, you know, that losing yourself in a lighthearted book is exactly what someone needs in a difficult exactly. time sometimes. Yeah. And, you know, it got me through a lot of that time. Yeah, I think that's a perfect answer. When you were telling me what they said, I was like, oh, my gosh, that's exactly what people needed. <laughs> You know. Yeah, that's what I that's what I think too. But okay, so C. Jane Date was your debut, but then it also gets adapted into a made-for-TV movie, which I'm a huge fan of. Those did you do you remember like how you learned that this was happening? You know, how did I actually find? You know, I hate to say this, but it might have been the internet. Like I would do a search for my name or something like that. And I think something came up in one of those websites like Variety or Deadline, like something movie focused. And I think it said that, oh, Melissa Sennett's, you know, novel is going to be adapted into a TV movie. <laughs> oh been my that. gosh. <laughs> I'm, I'm not even sure. I might be remembering, or it might've been that my editor emailed me and said, guess what? You know, we're going to, you know, turn this into a movie, but either way, oh God, was I thrilled. That it was just one coolest. of the most exciting things that's ever happened to me. Yeah. And it was it just felt like a miracle. And I love that adaptation so much. You and know, to that screen... reporter that had that disdain in his <laughs> voice, like, there you go. <laughs> that's why these stories matter. <laughs> yeah. Well, then looking online, it looks like it was the baby switch. That was your first Harlequin special edition. So can you tell us about transitioning from Red Dress Ink into special edition? Well, the Red Dress Ink books were, um, I guess, like considered single titles, which is so different than um, category romance like special editions. Um, and what I mean by that is that single titles aren't necessarily focused on any one thing, whereas special editions must be focused on the romance. Mm -hmm. um, and I love writing romance, but I feel like I have so much freedom in my special editions to write about what interests me, like what I want to explore and say about love and romance and life and people. And my editor has been an absolute dream about letting me try sort of interesting things within the line. 
Um, and special edition really centers on relationships, small towns, community, family, you know, but with a modern edge. And I've had an Amish heroine. I've had heroes return from the dead, <laughs> mistaken identity. I've had a lot of cop heroes. So I've, I feel like I have so much freedom to write what I want. And I just love that. Well, your upcoming Montana Maverick romance is A Lullaby for the Maverick, which was releases this July. Uh, will you share with us what it's about? Um, a Lullaby for the Maverick, it's about a 35-year-old wedding singer who has basically given up on love at this point, but not on her dream to become a mother. And she finds herself unexpectedly pregnant and the baby's father basically tells her he's met someone else. Sorry, bye. And so when she meets this hot rancher, her same age at her brother's wedding, um, where she's performing with her band, their chemistry is so red hot, but she's so cynical about love. And he says loud and clear that he's not ready for fatherhood. So they figure they're not a match, um, but they can't stay away from each other. <laughs> It sounds so good. And the cover is so <laughs> stunning. Uh, so I am excited at the sound of the way you create like a found family in this one with Bethany's pregnancy and then her and Theo's feelings for each other. So what did you enjoy creatively about writing their story? Well, I especially love writing about the changes that Theo goes through as he realizes um, that, you know, despite not wanting the responsibilities of being a parent right now or even in the near future, he can't control how he feels about Bethany from his attraction to her to this like deep need to be there for her. And he just finds himself caring so much about her and the pregnancy, wanting her to have everything she needs and wants. And he has to really like look inside himself to understand where the strong urge to remain a lone wolf comes from. And for Bethany, I just loved her evolution from being cynical about love to taking a big risk that changes her entire life. Well, are there any behind the scenes details of writing their romance that you can share with us? Like any songs you played or movies you watched, phone a friend moments, anything well, you can share? Well, you know, since my female main character is a wedding singer, I watched one of my favorite movies, which I've seen at least 10 times for the 11th time when I started writing the book for a little research. And I'm talking about The Wedding Singer with um, Adam Sandler <laughs> and Drew Sandler. Barrymore. <laughs> yes. That is just... I think the f such a fun, warm, just adorable movie. It's just, I just love it. Yeah. And I also did a lot of research like into Montana ranchers, ranches to just immerse myself in the details of like a big prosperous ranch in the summertime in big sky country. Well, are you working on anything now that you can share with us? Well, um, I actually have a deadline coming up this week. <laughs> okay. um, it's a Harlequin special edition about um, a single mom of a baby who becomes co-owner of a Wyoming ranch with a single father of a tween age daughter. And then after a lullaby for the Maverick, um, which will be published on June 25th, um, my next book will be published in November. And that's a special edition called the Cowboys Christmas Redemption. And where can everyone keep up with you online? Um, well, I have a website that's melissasenate.com and I can be found on Facebook um, also threads and Instagram under, under my name. And I absolutely love hearing from readers. So friend me, follow me. Um, you know, I'd love to connect. Well, thank you so much. You have to come back. You have more books coming out and I have a podcast and love to talk about. Books, so. Thank you so much, Bree. <laughs> this has been just wonderful. Wonderful.